Hey guys, welcome to Behind the Crew. On today's episode, I have Gary DeFranco. He is an executive producer in the film industry. We talk a little bit about what he did before he got into it. And then we talk a little bit about what he does currently. And we bag on each other. Enjoy. Can you explain what it is to be an executive producer? I can, but first, I was looking behind me because this is behind the crew. Make sure no one's behind me. No, no, no crew's there. behind you. Maybe behind the walls, but. Is this the first one you're doing? This is the first episode. Okay. Oh, yeah, you still got the price tag on this microphone. I do, I do. Uh, I, uh, it's nice. It's coming in a little hot. Is, is this because uh, it's new or because if this fails you want to return this and get your money back <laughs> i think it might be a little bit of both actually okay, good. i'm gonna take this off because i don't think you're gonna fail so that's fine i mean good luck good luck ripping that off oh, oh you just got the tag off. yeah you okay. can leave this for later okay i'll I do that when you're you, gone so uh now that you're you're screwed now yeah um, now i gotta keep them yep well um i i don't know how to to am i supposed to look at you or over there because that one's moving it's distracting me i'm used to being over there you can yeah, you can just you can just look at me. That one that one's probably not the one I want to look at. But yeah, you you can just look at me and talk to me. I don't think this is supposed to you're not supposed to see this. You know when you're you know when you're uh uh interviewing and doing OTFs and they say, you know, don't look at the camera, look at me. Yeah, but there's three cameras. Now it's there's on the you, other side. And then I can see you like over there and I can see all the wires and cords you're supposed to tape down. That's not OSHA. Yeah, Gary, this is first episode. First yeah, episode. Okay. We got your books here from Film school. I'd like to ask you a question before we start. Yeah, go ahead. How these doing you for your life in television? You, you, you good? Well, I actually did read all of those, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm still not shooting 100%, but I am shooting a little bit more than usual. I've read some of those, too, back in the so, day. Do you have Save the Cat somewhere? No, I don't. Oh, you got to read that. I don't even know what that one is. Read, read it. It's the, like the best. It's like one of the most popular screenwriting books. Save the Cat. Save the cat, yes. and it's and it's for production. It's a screenwriting book. Oh, screenwriting. Yeah. Okay, it's good. I'll look into that then. Um, so yeah, pretty much being executive rouge is kind of like this. You know, you just uh, distract the crew. Um, they have something they really want to do, and they got it all dialed in, and then you just start throwing audibles at them, and um, that's a big part of it. Um, in reality TV, it's uh, the biggest part is managing people. I think managing crew, cast network expectations um, within the budget um, and every day it's something um, and every show is different you might be working with Navy SEALs this week and Playmates this week and you know a tractor pull people this week and it could be sports or it could be just regular everyday people so in non-scripted aka reality TV you know the thing I like the most about it is it's always changing you get to Kind of live different people's lives uh you're meeting you know different unique people a lot of them have tons of talent and and something like the ultimate fighter our main goal is to find the most talented people on both sides of the camera in my opinion uh the fighters the athletes and then the people that capture their lives and you know tell their stories so um i'm gonna totally mess this up but someone asked clint eastwood in an interview i just saw not that long ago like how you had 60 years or 50 years of success in hollywood and he said it's pretty simple. I found the best people I could find and got the fuck out of their way. And uh, that's how I like to operate. You know, it's, uh, I don't know about all the techie stuff. You know, I, I know a little bit. I don't know about post-production that much, but I know a little bit. I know a little bit about everything. But what I do know is who's talented and who works hard and who's dedicated and has a passion for their craft. And that's what I try to do is find those people, give them what they need to succeed and get out of their way. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, I... I work with you quite a bit and I mean, I, I see you all the time. Well, when I do see you on set, you're, you know, you're putting out fires left and right. You're, you're on the phone constantly. You're, you, if you're not on the phone on like talking to someone, you're texting or emailing. I mean, 
uh, do you have time to sleep or it depends pre-production post-production of a show it's, it's relatively normal when you're in production of a show sleep is is rare um, depending on the show but um, budgets are shrinking with uh, you know linear television kind of going away in some ways and and people being able to create a lot of entertainment in different ways for much cheaper um, the budgets on the bigger shows are shrinking um, usually what happens with that is they cut the schedule shorter they want the same amount of everything and the same quality in half the days yeah um, and you know there's laws that regulate crews and stuff like that don't work too much and, and have days off and stuff like that and there's guys like me that are salary um, and we just got to get it done um, so we try to manage the expectations, but just figure out ways to be more efficient and, and get what we need and keep the quality at the same level for half the price a lot of time. Well, I mean, COVID also didn't help with that either with the whole, you know, the higher ups having an expectation to get it done quicker. So that's also, you know, kind of messing up the whole thing of, of the crew and, and production having the time to get it right and also you know oh they can get it done in you know two weeks cool well then we'll just keep doing that and you know that kind of bones other people doesn't it yeah I mean, well, in your opinion it's a it, it's a it's a complex issue right so traditionally a television show would be let's say it's an hour show it's 42 minutes the rest of the time is meant for commercials commercials fund the television show the commercial landscape is changing. You know, it used to be on a, on a primetime show, a 30 second piece could be 500,000, you know, 1.2 million. You know, now these advertisers are getting the same return on YouTube, on online, you know, and social media and different kind of targeted marketing. So they're not paying what they used to pay for the ads. So yeah. if you're not making the money in the commercials, that's what funds everything. So right off the bat, the networks are struggling because the commercial money's not in there. So they're having to find different ways to generate revenue um, and it just all flows downhill. You know, if uh, a show, you know, we'll pick a show. These are made up completely numbers, but something everybody knows, you know, pick like The Bachelor, say that's a $30 million show to make, Yeah. you know, and they used to make $50 million uh, on advertising, totally making these numbers up just as an example, you know, all of a sudden they're making 20 million. So, you know, they have to have some sort of profit. So now that goes from a $30 million budget to a $15 million budget just like that, you know, and they, you know, they expect the same product, the fans and the consumer wants the same thing. They don't want it to go backwards. So it's, it's a tough spot for everybody all the way down. You have the network people that are just trying to figure out new ways to bring in revenue and, and keep people coming back when, you know, everybody's got that phone that's easy to watch whatever you want. Um, and then that goes down to the production companies whose budgets are slashed in half. And then it goes down to the department head who's, you know, hires, you know, each piece, you know, it just, it all goes downhill and, you know, shit rolls downhill and everything. And the people at the bottom tend to, you know, it, it, I wouldn't even say that in reality TV that the people at the bottom really get it the worst because it's kind of all the way up. You know, there's there a show like I'm working on now used to have maybe 12 producers. We're down to maybe seven and we have to do a lot more than we used to do. And that's more hours. If there's less producers, then there's less and there's less coordinators and there's less PAs. Like everybody's bogged down, um, and the production assistants are, you know, the most important. I think the most important people on any set because nothing gets done without them. You know, we might think of these ideas and stuff, but that build all this shit. Like, you know, I can't do that. Someone's got to build this, right? Somebody's got to you know, do everything. They got to get the trash out of there. They got to keep the crews fed. They got to get crews from A to B. They have to do so much of the quote unquote grunt work. You know, it's how you make your bones in this business, but if you lose all them, then you got a bunch of suits sitting around not knowing what the hell to do and can't get from A to B. And you know, then you're the crew's going to be pissed. They don't have any lunch. They don't have anything to eat. They don't have anything to drink. They can't get to set. So I think the production assistants are the army, you know, and then it goes to the generals and, and higher up. But I think, you know, people need to respect people at every level. Um, if I'm not on a phone call or if I don't have something to do and people are unloading a truck, I'm going to unload the truck. I don't care what my title says. We got to get the shit done. I'm not going to sit there and watch and then like gripe that we're behind. 
you know, obviously yeah. there's like some producer shit I got to do sometimes and I got to be on the phone and, and handling things, but I'm not just going to sit there and no matter what, I'm just, I'm not built that way. And I think the good thing about reality TV is a lot of times you'll find a team of people from the top to the bottom working at a goal. And, you know, I think that's the beauty of it. I mean, we've had cast members that were taken on the stage on a show that I was doing a couple of weeks ago and like, told them not to do that especially because it's an athletic competition we don't want them to get hurt but you know that's that's the good thing about it i suppose and i ramble a lot and i'm not used to being on camera i mean can you can you uh can you name off a couple of the shows that you worked worked on or been a part of uh, i mean yeah sure i uh the ultimate fighter which is now on espn which was on a couple other networks before um i've done i think 39 seasons of that including international seasons in Brazil and China and Canada, the UK. Um, and that show is uh, the UFC's kind of uh, minor leagues. We find fighters that are right on, on the cusp, hopefully, of getting into the UFC. And they live in a house and they compete in a tournament. And, you know, we found, I believe, 14 world champions, hundreds of UFC stars um, throughout the years. And uh, that's the show that I'm definitely the most proud of. Um, I've been there since the planning of season one. So I think 2003 is when we started to plan it. 2004, somewhere like that, we started to shoot it. So it's, it's getting close to 20 years. Um, I've worked on a lot of stuff. I worked on a show called the DEA for Spike TV, where we followed the DEA around in Newark and, and Detroit for a while. I worked on a, call, a show called Playboy Shootout, which paired photographers and aspiring models and did a bunch of competitions. And then, the uh, you know, the winning team, we get the uh, centerfold. Hmm. And we shot that at a $30 million mansion in Malibu. Um, Never heard of that one. It's on the Playboy channel. I don't know no, who ever really had one. the Playboy channel. That's probably never, why I didn't uh, hear about that one. met anybody that had that, but somebody did it in 2007. Um, I worked on a show called Geek to Freak with Dennis Rodman. Which was the first show ever, our first original show ever broadcast in high def in America. It was on HD Net, which was owned by Mark Cuban. It was their first original show, um, and it was a shit show and a half. It was ridiculous. Um, I can't even describe how ridiculous it was. But we shot porn, straight up porn in Chatsworth with Dennis Rodman and Mark Cuban as my well as the cast and my boss. Yeah. Um, that was ridiculous. Dennis Rodman was ridiculous. Um, I'm sure I had no idea what I was getting into on that. That was my actual, probably first producer job, maybe, um, worked for a friend of mine and his wife was having a baby in New York right around that time. And he left me the checkbook and the Amex and just bounced and like, good luck with Dennis. Um, Dennis is on a, he, his contract was pretty awesome. He was on an eight hour day, but it wouldn't be docked against him if he showed up late. So oh. if he had a noon to eight and he showed up at six thirty, he had him for an hour and a half. And uh half of that time was him just not cooperating. Um that sounds perfect for him. Yeah, he did a show open to one of the episodes. We're at a uh concert venue and he just fucked it all up and I'm like, Hey man, like you gotta do that again. He's like, I'm not doing it again. I'm like, Man, you're getting like sixty, eighty thousand dollars an episode. Like, don't you want this to be successful? I don't give a fuck. And uh, I'm like, come on, man, just like do it. There's probably like 300 people at this concert, I would say. So he nails it. And I'm like, fuck yeah. And I had a, like a Kango hat, one of those like uh, golfer looking hats on at the time. So uh, he nails it. Samuel L. Jackson wears? Yeah, exactly. Okay. But to the front. No, and uh, so he nails it. And then there's a bar. It's, I think it was the Key Club in Los Angeles on Melrose. And uh, there's a bar like right next to the stage. And I'm standing by the bar and I'll give him the thumbs up. And he says, see that guy giving the thumbs up right there with the hat? He's going to buy a Jaeger bomb for everyone in the whole building. Oh, shit. 300 people. And they bum rushed that fucking bar. So I called my boss. I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. He's like, you got everything you need? I'm like, well, they're performing the, the bit right now that we need. It's going to be over in like five minutes. So I get everybody out except the guy shooting it and the sound guy. Get them in the vans. As soon as you're done, wow. you guys go out the back door and just dip. And I'm like, okay. So we we do that. That manager called me 3,000 times probably. And <laughs> Yeah, so thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Um, that was one of many, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned you mentioned early on one of the one of the shows that you said that was your first producer job. And I mean, how did how did you get your start into production? I mean, did you start off as a PA or 
did you start off right like going right in as an associate producer and work your way up from there or i started as an ac which is an assistant cameraman but that show did not have pas on it so i was also the pa so i never had the title but i had the duties um it's kind of a long story but um i went to unlv didn't do so well there and i met a guy that is my best friend to this day and uh he probably doesn't want me saying his name because he's like a really big deal in the business. And I mean, we can always bleep I'll it out probably, if you want. I'll probably get him in trouble. No, but his name's Adrian. And uh, he's the director of photography on Lego Masters and uh, Master Chef and he, like a lot of big shows. And um, so I met him in the freshman dorms at UNLV in 1997. Somehow we ended up on this floor of like kind of misfits, like all the fuck ups from the world that would turn out to not be fuck ups at all, you know, but. Yeah. He was kind of a raver, uh, EDM DJ type of kid, uber smart, really good guy, you know. And I was trying to be a rapper at the time and came from a rough spot in Cleveland and, and had, had troubles. And um, long story how I got to college in the first place, but I managed to get in through all kind of finagling. And then, uh, you know, we had all kind of different types of people like hippies and punk rockers and gangsters and ball players and just everybody on these dorms in this one floor. And uh, it's just really cool. So I met him in 1997. We went to college together. He went, got out in four years, always got great grades, went to film school. When, when he was done, he went to LA and started working. I started working at a record store, got a record deal with a really big record label at the time that ended up not coming through. Dropped out slash failed out of college. Um, I was living 20, 22 deep in a three bedroom apartment. We had no front door. The police had blown it off a couple weeks earlier. Nice. Um, people had to align themselves in a certain way just to sleep on the floor like Tetris because there was no room. I had no idea who lived there. There'd be somebody over there be like, whose kid's that? And they'd be like, that's so-and-so's kid. I'm like, well, who the fuck is that? And I'm like, whose dog is that? And they're like, that's the kid's dog. I'm like, I don't even know the fuck kid, the parent. Now they got dogs in here. I'm like, this is ridiculous. It was dirty. It was gross. Um, but it was fun. You know, it was a bunch of rappers that, that are still some of my best friends to this day and we're just trying to make it and it just, it was a hood situation, you know, he just didn't know yeah. people was just coming in. They needed a place to live and it was fun. But, um, so Adrian calls me and, and Adrian is the biggest perfectionist I've ever met. He is the neatest person. He is OCD as they come. Like everything is just perfect and clean and neat and professional. He's always been like that. And, uh, he's like, man, I got this, uh, opportunity to shoot on the discovery channel show um that's going on at one of the casinos in vegas um i need a place to stay until i start getting some checks because i'm already paying for my place in la and you know when you're just starting out and you're living in la you don't have shit yeah so i'm like man like this is your worst nightmare like <laughs> I, you don't want no part of this but of course like anything you need whatever so he moves out there and it's just as bad as you know as he imagined and i imagined and um i decided to leave i said you know we had 10 days left i think we had on the lease and i'm like, gonna go back to cleveland where i'm from and go to barber school or, or probably end up in the factory or worse selling drugs like a lot of people do back there or something like that yeah um so I, I was failing you know i was fucked and uh when i when i left cleveland in a rough environment and shit i wanted to go back as somebody or not go back at all so it was, it was a tough spot so adrian moves in and like three days in or actually three days till I was gonna go home, uh, they fire his assistant camera guy or he quit. I'm not I don't remember. And he's like, Hey, do you wanna be an AC? I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that means, you know? He's like, You just gotta help me, man, if you're like you're willing to learn, like, you know, like this might be your Oh yeah. Conference call time. Yeah, that happens a lot with uh executive producers. Um, we yell at somebody if their phone goes off on stage or, or you're on set, but it's ours. Yeah. Nobody can yell at me. Well, and it's, you know, you're the EP, so yeah, it's true. your phone can go well, off. We're going to cut that. Yeah, so uh, my buddy asked me if I wanted to be the AC. I said, I have no fucking idea what that is. And he said, you know, you could learn. Um, this might be your, your one shot at getting an in entertainment business. Um, I had been failed as a rapper. The the deal I got fell through. The, this mech, the record stores that I was managing went under. This is right when online shit started happening. And napster and all that came and then best buy was undercutting everybody and selling their cds at a loss it just shut you know it killed the record store industry so um he took me to burlington co factory and bought me a button-up shirt because at the time i was wearing like 5x starter jersey i'm about 5'5 five five. and uh got the shirt made this nice fake resume from, you know and like kind of went through it he he was completely against the fake resume part but i'm like i gotta have something he's like i don't know just 
telling the truth. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll, let's go with the fake resume part. So we sit down and uh, the EP of that show interviews me and looks and asks me a couple questions, hands it back to me. It's, it's all bullshit, isn't it? And I'm like, not all of it. He goes, not all of it. I'm like, that's my real name. <laughs> he fucking starts laughing. Um, he's like, are you really from Cleveland? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I went to college in Ohio. Are you a Browns fan? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'll give you a fucking one chance because you've suffered enough in your life. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so that's how it started. Uh, my first shoot was during the, the playoffs and we we're shooting in the sports book in Vegas and they set up a time lapse. I'm kind of high as a PD-150 or PD-170 or some shit camera back then. And uh, I got, got to, had to get all the releases, got them all. And I was supposed to just babysit the camera. He said, just whatever you do, don't fucking move. Just, just make sure nothing happens to this. Be cool. Yeah. So I had my first, for anybody watching this, it's on TV, you always have a walkie talkie and a little mouthpiece thing, like a security guard. You know, everybody has them on set. It was my first day with one. I had no idea how to use it. So a couple hours later, I got to piss so bad. And I keep just calling him. I'm like, hey, man, where are you? Like, I got to pee. I got to pee. And he's not answering. And, you know, I'm like, fuck. And uh, the bathroom's like, 10 feet away not even yeah. you know so i just go for it i got the folder with all the releases i got my backpack on i run in there's like a big garbage can there in hindsight worst place to set my shit but set the folder on the trash can go in take the quickest pee of my life come out come out there's just this lady just looking at the broken camera on the ground going i think i knocked your camera over oh, it was way in the corner no reason to go back there except i'm fucking nosy and she's like, well, I just wanted to see what it looked like. And the thing is just broke. And I'm like, fuck. Like, less than a minute. I was there all day. Perfect timing. He comes walking around the corner right as she's walking off. He's like, what did you do, man? They gave you one job. Like, fuck, man. I'm so screwed. And I'm like, man, I just had a piss. I was calling you. And he's like, look. She's like, yeah, fucking turn it on first. And I'm like, ah. You know, I'm like, I thought it was on. It like beeped and then stopped beeping. Like, so all that happens. And the lens is broke. So you're just fucked. And, uh. I'm like, all right, well, he's like, well, this shot's screwed. Let's just go back to the office. And I look, and the fucking releases are just gone. And I'm like, where the fuck are they? I swear I put them there. And, and it was a casino show, and they were shooting all the behind the scenes. I knew the security guard. So I'm like, we go look and just see, make sure I put it there, because I looked everywhere. Sure as shit, while I'm looking down at the lens, here comes the fucking uh, garbage guy or whatever. Takes it, just throws it in the garbage can, takes the bag, goes out the back door with it. It's like perfect storm. Um, yeah, so that was my first feeling. day. I had a feeling that's what happened with he, the releases. Yeah, he was so mad, like so mad to me because if you don't have a release, you can't use any of the footage. And then anything we shot after was not possible because the lens was in six pieces. So yeah, kind of shit's bad on that one. And for you know some people who don't know a release, uh, basically when you see a reality show or any type of show, and you see a fuzzy face or blurred out face, that means that they didn't sign the release. So that's what we had to do. It's a legal document that gives permission to show your likeness and voice and everything on TV or whatever. It's very important. Yeah. Um, so that was the beginning of it. Um, later that day, I was in the billionaire owner of the casino's office. I had been walking by and there's college football on or, or football game on. And I poked my head in, and said, you know, come in. So we had a little couch there and just sitting on the couch, I kind of, you know, lounging and it's not so bad, but like PAs aren't really supposed to like talk to the executive producer on some sets. I don't deal with any of that shit. Like I talk to everybody and stuff, but especially back then it was like the hierarchy was like very serious, you know? Yeah. Like don't look them in the eyes kind of stuff. So I'm like lounging with, and it's the owner of the casino and then the owner of the company comes in and you know, we're, we're just bullshit and whatever. And I make some wise crack. Like I always do. And the, the casino owner's like, well, that's your guy. He's not my guy. He's like, he's my guy. And uh, I said, I don't fucking know him. And he's like, I think he works for you. He's like, I'm like, and uh, I won't even say his name, but I say his name. He's like, you fuck wouldn't work for me. And he just motherfucked me the whole way down the hall and back up to the office. What are you doing? Just laying on this guy's couch. And he's the owner of this whole thing, blah, blah, blah. Um, 40 minutes ago, he just motherfucked me just like that again, 19 nice. years later. But it's all in love now. You know, we, uh, I've worked with him almost 20 years and we have a good relationship. And it's like, we're both, you know, from the Midwest and, blue collar kind of guys as you could probably see this is not what an executive producer normally acts or dresses like and um you know i i say it all the time i'm not a haircut and a button up you know i don't do that i'm just gonna get the shit done yeah you know if, if my body of work doesn't speak for itself i know plenty of people that want to hire me all the time and I'll, and I'll get the shit done but i'm not gonna be somebody different you know put on some kind of act like 
I'm going to get it done. And that's going to just be the end of it. And that's how I started doing this at that time. You know, I was never been lazy. I've always been a hustler, you know, even eighth grade, I had, you know, I was selling candy and marking it up and, you know, had little jobs all around the neighborhood. Like, you know, I got younger kids to bag up all the leaves and, you know, they did all the work and I, you know, charged $10 an hour and paid them six and kept four. And I was always having like that mentality where just hustling and like, yeah, you know, no matter what it was, some stuff I won't talk about on your podcast, but I've always been a hard worker, you know, and no matter what. And I realized at that time that I didn't fit in there at all. I was, I didn't go to film school. I wasn't from LA. Like I didn't yeah. speak the language. So the only thing I could do is be the first one there and the last one to leave every day and like hope I could outwork everybody and, and learn enough. And I still try to do that. I, I still try to be the first one in and the last one out. I still try to outwork everybody. Um, I, I still have that mentality that like I could be back on that fucking couch and 20 deep in the hood again if I, if I don't do that. So yeah, it's kind of been what, what I've always done. So that's how I got into this shit. And then uh, what's called a coordinator is like kind of runs the office and like day to day business stuff. And, and that person left and they were like, you could do that and get a raise. And, and like, it was a bitch being an AC back then. I don't want to be back in my day, but like they got it fucking easy. I mean, I, I was going through casinos with this huge battery belt on this big ballast with two one foot Kino tubes over my shoulders because that's how we'd light interviews because there's no like one buys or anything. Then I would have a few release. You had to have a Polaroid camera with a shit ton of Polaroid tape and every release you had to take their picture and staple it on there. Then I had these huge Anton Bauer bricks and you had to carry them because the van or the car was never close. So like eight of those in my backpack at all times. Then I had the audio's fucking MP1 batteries all in there. And then it was tapes. It was beta when I started and beta I mean, tapes are big. I mean, that was so much shit to carry. And I had a big release sign this big that I had to, you know, put and remember where the fuck it was at. And then you'd be in a nightclub and the camera guy would be like, yeah, I shot those six girls right there. Those two dudes right there. That tall guy over there. Those four people meet us upstairs. And, and it's a nightclub. Everyone's fucking hammered and like they don't yeah. want and, and it's a legal document. Some people actually want to read it, which is really annoying. And uh, when you're the PA yeah. or the AC and you're like, yeah, I just got to go. And you're like trying and like that. Someone just starts walking off and you're like, hey, fucking come back here. It's the worst job. And uh, you're doing that, and then they're calling on the walk. You're like, I need a battery. I need a battery upstairs. And there's 9 million drunk people between you and the battery. You're like looking like the Christmas story kid with all your shit. Like, that was not for me. And they're like, you could start making deals and doing paperwork and shit. And I'm like, oh, that's great. Instantly hated that, too. Like, just time cards and payroll and taping your receipts down on this little piece of paper just right. Oh, and yeah. Getting I, complaints. I'm like, oh. I remember that one. I did that, too. Yeah, so... You know, I was, I always knew I wanted to get to some sort of creative position. So it was a roundabout way to do it. But I, luckily I learned a lot, you know, I learned camera stuff. I learned a lot of audio stuff. I started mixing some audio at that time too. Oh. Um, speaking of audio, we, we don't, we don't hold for planes in this. Dude, show. you have so many, so many, uh, choppers going over here. This, this is a podcast. Okay. You got isotope? You don't have isotope? Thank you for all that. It doesn't, even have, it, it doesn't even have cards. This is just a test run. You don't even have cards in the thing. Look, there's no roll, scene, take. He doesn't even have himself as the director on his own show. I, I just took the price tags off these things. Oh, there's another one right here. Oh, you're screwed. You're not taking this thing back either. You're all in, bro. Yeah, we're all in now. <laughs> all in. Hey, I told right at the beginning, I'm like, oh, I don't know if you're keeping this on in case you fail, but I got faith, so I'm going to take it off. Yeah, we have another helicopter coming in. Is that a helicopter? Mm-hmm. I think... Um, I heard the choppers. Oh. Yeah, I think you should just put a camera on the roof, call it the chopper cam, and keep it moving. If you could see it, you could hear it. Number one rule. Well, this also gives me a break to drink something. Um, well, you... He had a lot of breaks when I was talking for like 43 straight minutes. He could be Breaks sipping on that ass. all the time. I've been setting this shit I up. I mean, the last 43 minutes. And you should have set it up yesterday. Mm. I, I didn't either. I'm working on a show now where people like to beat each other up inside the house, outside of the house. Um, it's a... Uh, wait till you see this. Just check TBS on Wednesday night starting in mid-January if you want to see the craziest shit you've ever seen in your life. And that is not hyperbole. No, but it's actual. Yeah, it's pretty crazy shit. I, yeah, it's I. I'm not allowed to talk about it right now. Um, 
but just I told you where to look. <laughs> TBS January. Yeah. That. Well, we're just going to roll through. I think we can't even hear the planes. You couldn't even hear me because you didn't have your headphones on for the first half of this. You have to dub it over like an old kung fu flick. I'll just do it for your ends. Let's go. Um, so you ended up getting into production coordinator. You hated that. And then you ended up getting. Then what? I was a production coordinator for a while. And then the next show was production coordinator. Then I was production manager. Then production supervisor, which was just some bullshit title they got. So I wouldn't quit at the time. Um, and then I was working on a fighting show, and nobody else w really wanted to take this interview position, start interviewing the fighters every day. And uh, the boss fucking hated me at the time, but she knew I was the only one that yeah. could do it. So I got my first producer job, which was interviewing you know the fighters on Ultimate Fighter Season 7 towards the end, and then Season 8. Um, and then that was my job on that show forever. I just I held on to that forever. Because the most fun is the interviews and stuff like that. Um, but finally, I had to let it go because it's had too much work to do. And you can't be eight hours in a garage interviewing people every day if you got other shit to do. So and that was always the most fun part. But that's when I got to get creative and get the people's stories told. And, you know, those interviews would, you know, they would base a lot of how the show is cut off the interviews and the experiences people are having and, and their life stories. So um, getting to the creative side has always been where I wanted to be always been some sort of artist whether it was painting or drawing or writing or you know lyrics or making music so any way that I could be artistic I try to do that and some people are artistic with spreadsheets and fucking google docs and stuff like that you know that's not me um being OCD yeah like I am and I keep my shit straight and, and I, I make a hell of a spreadsheet I just don't enjoy it yeah. I hate shitty spreadsheets though like make your shit match like if some words are capitalized all the way through make them like that some lowercase make the colors line up make the columns and everything the same size it takes two seconds just make it look okay and there's a video on how to do that there's a video on literally how to do everything yeah i still i still write with capitals and lower cases i also have a combination of, of cursive in there too so i don't think you'd like my you put cursive on, how do you get anymore. how do you get cursive on a spreadsheet? But I mean, I'm just talking about with with writing in general. Yeah, yeah. Like my, like I'm OCD with with certain things, but when it's, it comes to writing, it's just I'm just get it over with, and I hope people can read it. I never got an A in my life, like up to like I think sixth grade, and I wanted to get Jordans for the first time, I believe. My mom said if I could get one A, I could get Jordans. So I analyzed the situation mm -hmm. and. There's a penmanship class that I had, and I was like, if I could just learn how to write neat, that's the easiest road. So I have impeccable handwriting to this day. Um, it's very surprising. Yeah, I read a lot of graffiti too growing up. So, like, font, I'm a yeah. huge font snob, and like lettering, like, that's like a big thing. Like, yeah, things. I mean, that I guess that makes sense if you're, if you're into graffiti. Yeah, so, like, it's, a, it's an art in, in itself, I would say. Um, but, and, and you'll see me on it, and, and he said with a notebook and a pen, everybody else has iPads and everything, and I have piles of notebooks from every show I've ever done. I've got at least one, like, for 20 years, so there's, like, a lot of history in those things. Yeah. I'll say I don't have, I don't have, of that. I don't have that type of time to, to be doing that, yeah. but. Someone's got to be on Tinder, you know, man. That's true. TikTok, sorry, not Tinder. Sure. That, TikTok. Yeah. That's your your Tinder. I'm I'm TikTok. Yeah, it's true. I like to laugh and look at look at dumb videos. Yeah, and you don't want to have Tinder because you got a wife that kick your ass. Yeah, that's true. No Tinder, TikTok. I swear, I promise. TikTok's only. I mean, she's she's fucking glued to it too. But. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of what we how we started this we cutting of budgets. <laughs> you know, yeah. people stare at eight hours of TikTok, which is free, and. You know, a ninety-minute movie is too long now. So, for most people, I I enjoy watching three. Hour I would. Long I, movies. That's the only I time I could sleep is if I just paid to watch something, fucking unconscious. <laughs> I enjoy watching the long movies. If they're good. I I don't I don't have a, a short attention span. I I just enjoy it. Depends on what it is. Um, let's see. Obviously, you're you're an EP, so you've roll into most of these questions without having me to ask you like you know because you're 
NEP. Or because you gave you me the questions ahead of time and I spent my morning poop <sighs> looking at them. Well, we didn't have to say that. Yeah, keep it real. Okay, well, that's what happened. <laughs> uh, let me see. Try to see one where you didn't answer and roll that in there. I just I ramble. You're supposed to cut me off. And no, I like enjoying. In, in, I like inter- enjoying hearing interject. you talk. Well, <laughs> that one question was, "How did you get your start?" That was 45 minute answer. Yeah, and you went all the way through it. So I'm not going to cut you off there. We should have cards in this camera. I should put cards in there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a test run, so we'll, we'll get it on the next one. I grew up with a lot of yellers. EPs that would just fucking yell and be mean and throw shit. There's onions on their sandwich and they didn't want it. They throw it at somebody's fucking head. I made a point to never be like that. Sometimes it backfires because people don't always take me seriously when I'm actually being serious because I break people's balls all day long. Um, well, so I mean, that's true. Sometimes I can't tell when you're being serious. I mean, I, I can tell to a certain extent. But, I mean, there was a scenario a couple days ago where I forgot who you were talking to, but I think we were in the tech room, and I was like, I I couldn't even tell, and they couldn't tell. And then you were like, are you serious? Then I was like, oh, shit, yeah, he's actually being serious. Was it the freezer? I got to tell this story, and I'm not going to say any names, but... I think it was the the freezer. We got two locations. A freezer comes over to the second location. Looks like a refrigerator. It's like that gross tan color with the, you know, the door. Get, Get on the first day. Go to get a pop out of there, something, open it up, exploded cans, water's frozen. Yeah, something's wrong with the refrigerator. Yeah. Walk by, come back, you know, and like someone puts a little piece of tape on it, gaff tape, and it says freezer on there. I'm like, okay, that's now we know what the problem is. Open it up, full again. Okay, I'm filling this shit up again. Maybe they turned it down or something. No. Uh, come back the next day, and it, it's full again, and it's just, you know, a disaster in there. End of the day, it's you know, kid, young kids filling it up. Like we've established this is this is a freezer, right? Like everybody here knows it's a freezer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, well, what are you doing? He's like, well, the coordinator told me to fill uh, fill up the fridge. I'm like, yeah, but, but you know it's not a fridge, right? And uh, I walk off. You know, maybe I should say like, don't do it. So the next day, I come there's a table next to this freezer, and there's like thawing out drinks all over it, and I open it, it's full again, and I was like. What is this table for? And the kid says, "Well, that's where everyone thaws out their drinks." I mean, now there's a fucking system. Oh, we have, a, we have a thawing table. There's that's, a thawing table here. That's and nice. like, I don't want to shit on the younger generation, but well, sometimes you can. Most of the time, you can actually. There, I'm, there is no way in hell my generation is having a thawing table, <laughs> like, and just filling it up every day. Like, finally, like people think I'm mean, but I'm like, get this thing the fuck out of here, you know? Like, Jesus, we look like. Yeah. Like, oh man, it was like we look like amateurs here. It's like LaCroix just, you know, you know, I don't know if you work at TV, but exploded LaCroix will make camera guys cry. Uh, yeah, that is true. It's uh, like pop, but it has no taste. I don't understand why they love them so much. Yeah, it's like some woke. It'll be a mystery to stuff. Me. Like somehow it has better for the environment, maybe. I mean, I wasn't even, I, I didn't even hear about that story. I knew the whole freezer thing, but I didn't know they came out with a thawing table. Well, it was short lived. I was about to put somebody through that WWE style or AEW style. Yeah, I, I yeah, <laughs> I can't believe that was. I'm that like, was a thing. I'm like, there's there's a system now. <laughs> That's just so weird. Yeah, but it's it's part of the reason I think I I was able to be successful is problem solving is like a huge part of this business because you you're, it's always something new. And most shows I work on are true non-scripted shows where we don't fake shit. So if you didn't shoot it, it didn't happen. So yeah, if a camera breaks, or we got no cards in the camera or whatever. Like you better have a solution right in the moment because stuff's happening in real time and you yeah. can't stop the time. So you better figure out a way to capture that and get people where they need to go and get what you need to do, you know, accomplished. So you got to solve problems, you know, uh, no matter what it is. And we have a really good team that's good at that. Rolling into, I mean, rolling into to that story, getting to the point where you had to like, I don't know, I guess yell at them and be like, are you, like, is this I, there, serious? There's, there's is this no a ye- serious no, thing? Yeah, there is no yelling. Yeah, I, I definitely. The only time I'm going to yell on set is if somebody's doing something unsafe that's going to get somebody on my crew or on my cast hurt. Then I'm going to yell. But besides that, you know, I'll be, I'll be extra sarcastic. No, oh, so the, the 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 usual Gary then. Yeah, just put a little, put a little flavor on that shit. 
<laughs> so I mean, I mean, well, going into, I mean, going into that, then if you're gonna yell at people for being unsafe and you want everybody, I mean, is your job stressful? Oh yeah, I, I mean, it's very stressful. I'm, I'm not a pass the buck kind of person. So if shit gets fucked up, I take the blame. So I have a hundred people under me that are fucking shit up every day because every everybody does. Like every set, there's gonna be mistakes, right? It's just, yeah. It's it's chaos, whatever, and I like people that own up to their shit. You know, I would way rather you mess something up terribly and admit it and try to make it better than kind of mess something up and, and throw somebody else under the bus. That's the one thing I don't like. You know, I don't hire people that do that. Take accountability. Don't do it again. Don't blame other people. Work together. You know, get ahead by your hard work and your character, not trying to chop people down and make other people look bad. That's the quickest way to get on my bad side. You know, yeah. everybody doesn't know everything and they got to learn. If you're trying to get better, you're trying to learn, you're trying to contribute and, and you're a team player and, and you don't do anything shysty to other people, then, you know, I'll, I'll hire you and I'll work with you. And if you make mistakes, then just don't lie to me and don't try to cut other people's throat and don't try to throw people under the bus and set people up to fail. I don't, I don't play that at all. Um, I would way rather you mess up 10 times and admit it 10 times than like one little mess up and lie about it or, or try to get someone else in trouble. Yeah, I mean, it's just a respect thing at yeah. that point, you know. And no one um, wants to hear it. If I fuck, if, if something happens bad on a show I'm on and a network is mad or my boss is mad, they don't want to hear about a PA or a coordinator or a camera guy in AC that, oh, it's their fault. They don't want to hear that shit. Yeah. You know, I'm, they don't know them, you know, like. Well, I think, well, nor they do, do they care. I mean, who did it? It's no, just. I, you know, I something happened said, and it's yeah, it got yeah. fucked up. Yeah, it's it's stressful because you don't know who's gonna do what. You know, your camera gets run over right before a huge scene. Like I didn't know that the assistant camera guy was gonna set it in the middle of the street and walk away from it. You know, yeah. like I didn't know that like we only have five microphones and three of them are like in a van that the keys are locked in across town right now. You know, I didn't. You know, that's but how do you figure it out? You know, yeah, get it done. But there's there's always something like every day. Do you uh, uh do you happen to have uh you know any extracurricular activities besides work? I mean, I know you work twenty four seven, but I mean, do you have anything else besides that? I mean, you mentioned that you had a. Uh, uh, I like to make music. I like to draw, paint. Um, I like to box. Um, I read a lot of books. I don't watch TV really. Um, which is kind of weird, I guess, but. That's I most. Watched, that's most people in in production don't watch TV, which I think is weird. But I used to watch a lot of TV. I could recite every word to Saved by the Bell, every word by to The Office. I watched all this stuff. Saved by the Bell was a different reason. Like that, I know that. Uh, Topanga. Well, no, that was not. Topanga's not Saved by the Bell. No. Oh, oh boys, yeah. boys, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I just, shut up. We're yeah. there. I had to. Saved by the Bell. Yeah, I don't even remember. Yeah, because you're 22 years old. I'm 31. You're 31. Yes. Shit, I thought you'd be way farther along than 31. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. I, I joke. Dylan's killing it, and I always try to hire him as much as possible, um, mainly for his upbeat personality and big smile. Uh, <laughs> opposite. Opposite. <laughs> uh, you can never tell when Dylan's happy or mad. You know, punch somebody or hug him. Yeah. I mean, but, it's just my... Yeah. You should play poker. I'm actually really bad at poker. <laughs> Man. I, I like playing it, but I, I don't have a I don't have a poker face. I try. <laughs> you just gotta uh, be like I don't know, like I've never seen anything I just can't well, I, I can't uh, people fucking notice immediately. I don't I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Yeah. But, but it is what it is. To me, watch I mean watching T V is I like to be creative and make shit. So if you're watching somebody else's I watch stuff to see what trending and what people like and, and new techniques and stuff but you know and maybe i'll binge something every now and then but i have very limited free time so if i'm sitting there vegging out on the and i did that for well over a decade get off work turn on the same shit you know i used to smoke weed back in the day and just smoke weed and stare at the tv for five hours and fall asleep and then you know in television we're all freelance mostly so you work four months straight and just get your ass kicked and then you got a month or two off and then you don't want to do yeah. shit and you end up on the couch and then your vacation has gone and you're back to work and you don't accomplish anything you don't do anything so um this is going to sound terrible but covid was like the best thing that ever happened to me personally because it gave me a chance to like read again to write again to paint to draw to make music to 
do all those things and like learn the new, you know, I hadn't made any music in 15 or so years. Everything's different. You know, I, so many books that have came out and, you know, even drawing on a tablet. I never did that before. And stuff like that was just like, how, how do I, I wanted to create, wake up and create something every day. And I found old screenplays and old books that I started to write 10, 15 years ago and, and talked to my friends from college and, you know, that we started these with and all started getting projects back going. And, um, so now, I, you know, I, I have a studio in my house. I just make music every day or I paint and I draw and like that's uh that's kind of like my Zen moments. I, I you know, it's like always so chaotic everywhere and if I could just zone in on something and, and draw or paint or make a beat or something like yeah. that, that like that's like my meditation. Because normally it's like phone, you know, watching this, like for some reason there's a screen right behind you and you're like, You don't even know why it's there and there's no cards in the camera and you just can't stop looking at it. Mm -hmm. And then it's mm -hmm. like so much distraction. Yeah. Like to just and I, you know, you know, I have ADHD like really, really bad, and I've never taken any kind of medication for it. My mom was against that, and so like I've had to come up with like ways to deal with that. And one has always been reading, you know, getting into a book or writing or painting or drawing, and something that I could just have like a singular focus on. Um, when all you know, when all the chaos is going on, just zone in on something. So well, wow. work and I mean, I do that. You you. You mentioned you mentioned earlier that you back in the day you rapped and now because I mean you 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 know, you stopped for a while and then because of COVID you you started up again. I mean I've known that I knew I knew that you rapped before. I mean for the people who don't know your I mean, is your rap name still Don Ruckus? Yep, you know, from fourteen to twenty three or twenty four, that was my whole life goals dreams aspirations i grew up in cleveland with bone thugs and harmony um i opened up shows for them as a kid um they were the the biggest shit in the world to us back then and you know the only ones that ever made it out of cleveland doing that when i got to college I, I pursued that even after college but um i got signed to death row records by suge knight and very shortly after that he went to prison for pretty much ever um it all folded and that was right when the record store shut down and when right. i got my first tv job i was like i gotta focus on one thing and i can't have one foot in and one foot out so for you know 15 years i didn't do anything freestyle and shit when i got drunk and around friends but yeah uh, when the COVID hit i had just lost one of my best friends who, who was a dj that i used to work with he worked on a lot of tv shows with me and he was just talking to me all the time and like forever he was trying to get me back into music like you're just wasting your talent you need to do stuff and he was always like my biggest hype man and uh you know when i was sitting there by myself when covid started you know and like i would just hear his voice and like in my head and just like fucking do it you know so i got this beat that i wanted to make that was kind of like uh, a tribute to him and i got a you know a little akai mini keyboard for like 100 bucks on amazon and it had little four drum pads on there and my macbook and i started working from there and then slowly you know built a whole studio in my house and I have a sound booth and a lot of equipment and you know it's been probably two years almost now of just you know making music every day like I, I won't go to sleep unless I try to make something even I got iPad or my phone my computer like make something every day yeah and uh I don't I don't want to make money off it if it comes it comes but as soon as you you, you attach you know, some people always say like, find the thing that you love and make it your job. And you never, work. that doesn't work for me. That fucking kills it when it's a creative thing to me. If I start to have to make my music or whatever for you and what you like, and if someone has to criticize it and like, that's, it's the quickest way to turn me off of that. So now it's a, it's a hobby that I'm, you know, I think I'm getting better and better at every day. I always say in anything, try to get 1% better every day. And, yeah. Um, it's something I, mean, I really enjoy. And, um, I always like performing as a kid and like, before there was eight mile, like I was in, in, at least in my memory, I was living that life of being the only white kid up there. And it's, you know, it's a battle rap type scene. And, yeah. You know, I just always, I just never was afraid to get beat up and shot at and everything else that came along with everything in, in that environment. So I would go up there yeah. and just whatever. I mean, I mean, I remember the music video. It's terrible. So but the music my buddy's video in there. it, you know, that yeah. uh, 1999, we made that video for a 24 hour film festival. He had uh, 24 hours. We had to write, produce the song, shoot the video, edit it, hundred dollar budget, um, nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, it's it's funny to me, but also at the same time, I, 
I think it's back in the day and that that type of money that you had and with the gear you had. I mean, this is this is basically the gear that I have right now, and it's not much, but it's still something. So I mean, going bringing twenty thousand dollars worth of shit in here probably combined, right? With you know what my yeah, my my buddy Jordan and myself we had a little right high now. eight camcorder. So and that's the same. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. the same. Yeah. When it's it, relevant. And one of those, and uh, most of the budget went to a bottle of Hennessy and two little lights for the car that, you know, <laughs> yeah, came I from Radio that. Jack. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. Um, so, I, I mean, that that also helps you with your stress you to, you know, doing some yeah, beats, doing, yeah, you know, rapping. That's, and, that's the stress reliever. That's yeah. the, yeah, that's keep me from flipping my shit yeah. and uh, throwing a freezer at somebody. <laughs> I mean, and, and, you know, besides... EPing on on you know the shows that I happen to work on as well. Do you have any other like work that you do like uh you know I like to try to be at the cutting edge of stuff now. You know when I was behind the curve in music and I've seen everything go online and everything like this. So um, I work with a ton of young fighters and artists that have all this talent but they don't know how to market themselves and and I try to get brands to work with them or try to teach them, you know, or connect them with social media people. And when they have a platform on one of these shows, it's, it's short lived, you know, a million people see every week and then it's done. So how to capitalize on that and like, you know, get different people in different creative fields to start, you know, thinking as entrepreneurs as well. You know, yeah. I think we, we never learned that in school, like you could own your own thing or you could do your own thing, but now you can like social media has made anybody could be a business person and you can figure out something to sell and who wants to buy it and how to get that in front of them or, you know, something in, in that of that nature. Like it's yeah. a big thing. So, um, you know, now I'm starting to try to get brands for people that we're making ourselves instead of getting you a hat brand, like to sponsor you, why don't we make our own hats instead of getting, you know, whatever, a cosmetics brand, that cosmetics brand that's going to sponsor you probably is white labeling that cosmetic from a different place. And you get it for a tenth of the price from the exact same place and put your label, your label on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So why not sell your brand? Cause it's your fans that are going to buy it. So why are you going to take 2% commission on something when you could take 80% of the profit on the same exact thing? So, um, trying to get people to think like that and buy their own, you know, start their own brands and, you know, even with clothing, like drop shipping and everything, like you can make a hundred designs, put it on your website and they only make it when somebody buys it. So you don't have to have inventory and all this shit like you used to. You don't have to have a brick and mortar store. You have to pay for power and insurance and stuff. If you're creative and like come to me and I will try to help you sell that creativity in a way in which it doesn't compromise. Yeah. You know, your vision, your goal, because people want to buy shit. You just got to see it. You know, and they want they want to support people, and uh, I think all of these people have a platform, and people that look up to them and buy their music or watch their fights. I think there, there's additional stuff to that, especially with fighting. You know, one pe- one punch, one knee twists the wrong way, your career's over. And fighters, you know, are they're indestructible in their own mind. They have to be, and they're gonna fight forever. And it's also mentality they have to have. So, and I could help them plan for the future. And, you know. Maybe it's tomorrow or ten years from now they're gonna need it. I really try to, you know, get them thinking that way. And well, what could I do? What could I endorse? What could I sell? What other businesses? You know, with. I mean, well, is it? I mean, is it just yourself doing this, or I mean, do you have like a? I mean, did you like make a business for yourself, like a side business? Yeah, it's a total side that. business, and it's one of the things where if, when I need more people, like freelance, they you know I'll bring them in. I don't have you know a ton of staff, but depending on the projects, bring people in, get it done. And then, you know, so I have freelancers that work for me doing that. And, um, yeah, try to get people doing other stuff. You know, if you're a camera guy and there's just no camera work right now, like what else can you do? You know, and yeah, that kind of thing. So um, I'm really all about like everybody rising together and connecting people. And if I know someone that has this piece and that person needs that piece, like just try to put them together and I don't need a piece of whatever it is like yeah. it, it all works out in the end if everybody is connecting and helping each other and you know it, it grows so i always look for ways to like get people to do what they want to do and, yeah. and what they love to do you know it's like well it's, i mean you help me do that too so yeah i mean that's that's what it's all about like i'll probably work for you one day it's what i always think of you know like 
if you look at the jobs I have now, like pe most people that work for me or with me have either hired me for jobs later or we've been working together for 20 years. It's like very rare that if someone's still in the business, I don't keep working with them if they're good, you know, at what they do. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my talent is mostly finding other talented people, I think. Like, I mean, that's, that's a good way to sum that up. I mean, I, I kind of agree. I mean, there's more to it as well, but I think, I think what you said, you know, kind of killed it right there. Um, I think I just have two more questions for you. Um, one of them is, um, if you have, a, you know, you have, you have somebody watching this that wants to get into production and, or, you know, is just interested in all this, you have, you, you have one piece of advice if, you know, if they are trying to look to get in or just any type of advice. Uh, I think, the best advice in in general I could give anybody is work hard and be cool and be a team player and learn as much as you can. I hate when people want to get promoted to a job they know nothing about just because they've been doing the other job for a long time. Yeah. Like, and when I wanted to be a producer, I came in on every day off and shadowed. I stayed late every day and shadowed. I wanted to know the job before I got the job and, and I, you know, Part of it was the show of it. Like, why is Gary still here? Oh, he's doing that. You know, you know, aren't aren't you off today? Like, nope, I'm coming. You know. Yeah. But I was learning on those days, and I found people that were really good at something, and I, I asked them questions all the time. I was probably really annoying, but you know, people always come up to me like, "Oh, I want to do this," and then that's all. Like, I don't see them. You know. You don't see them put the effort no, in. No, like you want to yeah. be a camera guy, but you don't know how to use a camera. And there's four of them sitting right there while you're fucking off on lunch for an hour, and you yeah. didn't pick it up. And I know and you, the people we work with like to teach people. Like there's a new kid and hey, you know, maybe not right when they're taking their first bite of their lunch, but they're sitting around like, hey, how does this work? How do you white balance this? Is this like this? Like 99% of the camera guys I know will sit there and teach the kid what to do. Yeah. And fucking YouTube has the answer for literally everything. Like learn, work hard, you know, don't complain, show up early stay late. I mean, it's, it's the same with anything. And like, I don't know if it's this generation, because the older generation probably said that about my generation and we probably always feel the same way about it. But like, if you're passionate about something, it shouldn't be that hard to work hard and, and get there early and stay late. And you know, it's not my job is the worst fucking answer that I hear. Oh, it's not my job. Like do it though. Like it needs to get done. We're on the same team. Like, if you're the sound guy and you, you know something, if something you're capable of, do it. If you're the audio guy, if you're the camera guy, DP, like your PA, like if you're capable of doing it and it's something that's safe, whatever the case may be, just do it. Like we're all working together. You know, if you're going to sit there and complain on how long something's taken and watch somebody load the whole van and you could have just jumped in and load it, just load it and get out of here, you know? Yeah, you could have just hopped in and helped and got done yeah. way quicker than, you know, just watching someone. Well, my pants are vibrating like crazy, which means there's a problem. Well, I got, so. I got, I got one more thing. Do you have a, you have anything you want to promote, uh, get out there or anything? Um, I just got, I'm not going to promote anything about myself, but I have a motto and it's hype your friends. Like you'll buy all this clothes at the mall. You'll buy art. You'll buy all the shit and you don't buy your friend shit. Buy your friend shit. It's just as good. If not better, just buy your friend shit. They'll buy your shit. Like. Friends got cool t-shirts, buy every one of them. They make paintings, buy them. They, you know, they have music, buy it. You know, don't ask for it for free either. Like, yeah, help you know, them, helping them. Yeah, that's helping them friend, out. Yeah, don't do that. Every every shirt they give you for free, they got to sell five to make up for that one that's gone. Yeah. Pay the twenty dollars. Be cool about it. Hype your friends up. Support their shit. They'll support your shit. Don't be a hater. People get jealous of their own friends. Like, if, if you feel it's a challenge, then do better. And just that's it. Hype your friends up. If if and if your friends don't, and if something good happens, and you see a guy in the room that's not smiling, fuck, don't fuck with them anymore. This person's never ever gonna care about you. They're gonna that you have an enemy right there or adversary or and you know except for Dylan because he never smiles. But I mean, if that if that person's not happy when you're happy, not happy for your accomplishments, like I as I've gotten older, my circle of friends has gotten much larger. But I've also started cutting people out that don't want to see me succeed. And, and, you know, I don't need anything back from somebody if I do something for them. I, I never will ask for it. 
but I feel like you put it out there, it's going to come back anyways. You know, if your circle yeah. of people are all creative and good people and trying hard and working together and doing the right thing, like it comes back. If I need something, it always falls right in my lap every time. Right. And, and it's, it's like that for all of us because we get each other's back. So hype your friends. That's all I got to say. Well, and that's why I'm here at eight thirty in the morning. Um, <laughs> Well, I set all this stuff up. I almost took a microphone to the face. Yeah, trying to help me out. Um, yeah, I think this is going to be a success. And, uh, you know, people are all going to be like, oh, I was there from the beginning. Nope, this is episode one. I was there at the beginning. Well, yeah, like I said, or like you put it, uh, thank you for being here. I, it was pretty early. I, I know you're busy as shit, but I really appreciate you coming in and getting, you know, episode one down in the books. Yep. And don't drink four espressos before you go on a podcast because you're going to have to pee really bad and you're not going to stop talking to me. There you go. So, thanks, Gary. Thanks, man. And, and I just got fired during that. <laughs> I really hope you didn't.